Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the last webinar for the year from the Office for Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence. My name is Nicole Leggett. I'm the Executive Director of the Office, and today I have with me many of my colleagues so they can talk to you more directly about some of the work that they've been doing this year. Um, before I do introductions and move into that, I just wanted to acknowledge that we're joining you here today from Wogula, from Wajak Noongabuja, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that many of you are meeting on today. Um, so I'm just going to run down the line so that you get an idea of who's sitting here with me. Um, we have Gail Connor, who is one of our senior policy officers, Selena Gatley, who is our manager of strategic policy, Emma Roscoe from our commissioning team, Fiona McQuiston, our new manager of FDVRT Central, and Mike Basto from our practice team. Um, so as you may have guessed from that introduction, I guess our intention today is to give you a bit of an overview about um, some of the work that's been happening in all of our teams um, over the last couple of months, including to provide updates on some of the pieces of work that we've been talking about through the year. So um, Zoe, if I can get you to move down. I've also got the wonderful Zoe Smith who's driving the slides today. Thank you, Zoe. Um, as you, as we've talked about before and as you have seen before, the way that the Office for the Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence has now been established is to give us clear programs of work across four areas in particular. Those areas are strategic policy, service design and innovation, practice, and um, the operational support and central coordination for family and domestic violence response teams. Kind of sitting across all of those programs of work is our commissioning work as well, which we will talk about in a little bit more detail. So really the intention of this slide is just to give you an overview around what each of those four um, teams is working on. It's not all of their work, it's just some of the main pieces of work that they um, have responsibility for at the moment. Um, so with all of that said, and I guess with that very brief introduction, I'm going to hand over to Selena first. Selena's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the key work of her team over the last few months, um, and also firstly, um, a bit of an update on 16 days in WA, or perhaps a bit of a recap, given that we are two days away now from the conclusion of what has been another really successful campaign. Selena. Thanks, Nicole. Kaya, everyone. Uh, yes, as Nicole said, um, the, that we're up to day 14 of 16 days in WA, and what you're seeing on the slide is just a, a snapshot of some of the activity that's happened over the campaign period. And I'd like to acknowledge um, the work of the sector in um, promoting and um, getting behind this campaign. And we um, have had the focus on the issue of gender-based violence being everybody's business. So that's really enabled um, comprehensive engagement, not just in our community services sector, but with other industries. And the, the Premier was a keynote speaker at um, a business breakfast um, last Tuesday, and we had sponsorship from a number of um, private industries in the resources sector. And I think that's, that really highlights that the the, the message and the opportunity that people take to um, be part of this campaign is, is growing. So we're really excited by that. Um, nonetheless, it's a, it's a really important issue to, to highlight and um, the silent march that we had an opportunity to be part of as a department um, last Tuesday as well was um, a really critical way to show our support to the sector. And we really thank the, the um, Peaks for continuing with that important initiative and, and highlighting the issue of um, violence against women and the impact of, um, of it on families. And as we know, it's a live issue with um, several alleged homicides, uh, femicides actually over the last um, week and a half. So with 16 days being um, close to the end, uh, the, the work continues and we've had the opportunity to make some really important announcements, which I know my colleagues will speak to more detail on. And um, 
this is really just a, a recognition of the, the work that's gone in to get the campaign ready and to acknowledge the work of the sector in being part of the campaign and, and promoting um, the, the opportunity for people to be part of the change that's needed to end violence against women, um, but also to recognise that this is, a, this is in effect a period that leads up to a very, very busy time for the community services sector and, and the family and domestic violence specialist services in particular. So we, um, we uh, acknowledge that, that this is, is potentially a leading to a very busy time um, for your services as well. So um, I'll move on to talking about the strategic policy function in the Office for Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence, which I have the privilege to, to lead with, um, with my team. And one of the reflections I wanted to share with you is that um, the team that's listed on the slide there, Lindsay, Taya, Emma, Gillian and Suki, are not the team that I started with at the beginning of this year. So in a way, it's been um, a year of, of two halves for our team. And um, so, the, but the work has continued and we have been very focused on various work through our strategy. So I, I know you'd be very familiar with our path to safety strategy to reduce family and domestic violence across the state. And we've continued with our work as the lead government agency on um, delivering that strategy in partnership with other government agencies, health, justice and WA police in particular. And um, Put, uh, promoting the governance for that strategy um, through our steering group and I'm anticipating that there would be a number of you here today who are part of our um, steering group. So we've had five meetings this year which have been a really important opportunity to um, reflect on how the work of Path to, Sa Path to Safety is progressing through the first action plan and also to take up the opportunity to talk about key emerging, emerging policy issues, um, including um, things like coercive control, which is work that our colleagues in the Department of Justice have been leading in terms of criminalisation of coercive control. So we're, as we get towards the end of this year, we're focused on finalising a report on the first action plan of Path to Safety um, in collaboration with our government partners. And we um, anticipate that piece of work will be finalised um, early next year. And that will then be something that um, government can um, consider and, and put out and, and help um, us to uh, continue to work out what the next priorities are as we move into um, a planning cycle for our second action plan. Uh, the other piece of work that has been um, a focus for our team over this um, last 12 months and, and beyond is the development of the Aboriginal Family Safety Strategy. And again, I'm anticipating that a number of people in this webinar have taken the opportunity to um, engage with that process and it's been a comprehensive development process. We had a consultation draft of the strategy released earlier this year and then based on the feedback from over, around 100 submissions, we've um, uh, finessed and finalised the strategy and um, worked with our government partners on presenting that to government for endorsement and, and anticipating uh, a release of that strategy before the end of the year. And really critical to that work has been situating it um, within the work that the state's doing to um, organise around closing, close the national agreement on closing the gap and, and the Aboriginal Family Safety Strategy will be um, the state's response to outcome 13 that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and households are safe. So we're looking forward to 2023 being part of a really focused effort, effort on implementation of that strategy. 
We've also had the opportunity to work with our justice partners on um, uh, developing the state's first sexual violence prevention and response strategy. And the critical phase has been doing a lot of the background development work for that strategy and, and getting the governance up. So I wanted to acknowledge any of our justice partners who might be um, in today's webinar. Then, um, so that gives you a sense of some of the, the state strategy work that we've been doing, but it's also been a busy year for us in the federal space with um, the Commonwealth Government um, developing the next national plan to end violence against women and their children and uh, a change of government uh, happening in, in that time period as well. So uh, all states and territories worked with the Commonwealth and with um, jurisdictional stakeholders to inform the finalisation of that national plan, which was launched by women's safety ministers, including um, Minister McGurk's WA's um, women's safety minister in October this year. So we've got a really strong forward direction in the in the national um, space on violence against women and children. Um, and I've touched on 16 days, but yes, our team's also responsible for the planning and delivery of, of that campaign. And I think it's the, the first time under the, um, with the office being established that um, we've taken um, direct leadership on, on that, that's on that campaign um, in partnership with our corporate communications area. So um, no let up for us. It's been um, a busy um, end to the year. And like I said, in terms of what we're looking forward to is the release of the Aboriginal Family Safety Strategy and also some, some key projects that will align to that, that strategy, including a, um, a project that the Aboriginal Health Council of WA are taking forward to in, um, seek expressions of interest from um, Aboriginal medical services to um, provide family, domestic and sexual violence capacity through their service um, into regional communities. So we're looking forward to that, that project really taking off early next year. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Um, I'll get you to move one down, Zoe. So our next um, speaker is actually Gail. So Gail is um, standing in today for Stacey Collins, who's the Director of the Service Design and Innovation Team. So um, if I can hand over to you, Gail. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I just wanted to tell you about some exciting announcements that have been made during 16 days in WA. Um, and these are about important investments by the government in the area of primary prevention of family and domestic violence. So firstly, expansion of respectful relationships to support and recreation. <clears throat> um, recently, it was announced that $630,000 was awarded to Starrick Services to deliver a two-year pilot for a bespoke version of the Respectful Relationships Teaching Support Program, which is currently delivered to schools. So that's going to be tailored to be suitable to be delivered to sport and recreation clubs and organisations. And this commitment will expand respectful relationships approaches to address positive relationships in the context of family and domestic violence prevention through those clubs and organisations, which is wonderful. Um, it'll be a whole of club approach to um, violence prevention, and it's expected that this will commence in early 2023. The next point is on the first responder training. Another exciting announcement was made. And this was that an expansion of the sector recognised training to an additional 3,000 uh, first responders, which builds on the 2017 election commitment that provided FDV training to Western Australian Police Force staff. Uh, a grant agreement has been executed for approximately $2 million, and that was to St John's. Um, this will build the capacity of St John's WA um, triple zero workforce, including call takers, paramedics and volunteers to respond, uh, recognise and respond to incidents of family and domestic violence. The funding will also assist St John's to identify and categorise instances of family and domestic violence to help to reveal a broader picture of what's happening in that space and the impact it's having on Western Australia. Also, we had a really exciting announcement of the nearly $3 million awarded to 17 Western Australian organisations through the Family and Domestic Violence Primary Prevention Grants Program. 
Uh, the program is funding primary prevention initi initiatives that target the gender drivers of family and domestic violence. And this um, will complement the work that's being done to develop a primary prevention framework and training. Um, communities working closely with the Centre for um, Women's Safety and Wellbeing and Stopping Family Violence under the Preventing Violence Together initiative to progress this commitment. And so the work of that includes the convening of communities of practice that will support the grant recipients um, with their prevention programs that they're receiving funding for. So it's a really exciting announcement. So if we move to the next slide, this slide here gives you an example or actually sets out the successful recipients names um, of the organisations and their projects. So um, applications for the grants program closed on the 30th of September and there were 52 applications received from 48 organisations. So um, that was a really good take up of that grant program. It was so exciting to receive so, receive so many applications. Hard work to carefully assess them, but it was done. And um, the successful uh, organisations have been contacted. The grant recipients represent a wide variety of organisations uh, across WA, um, and that the areas are located in Perth, Peel, Great Southern, Southwest, Kimberley, Midwest, and Pilbara. So that's an amazing spread across the state. Um, 15 organisations were funded under the Family and Domestic Violence Prevention Program grants program to deliver 17 programs. So that's indication that one organisation received three grants for three programs and um, the others received a grant each. Um, it's interesting that of the 17 funded programs, 15 of these are either led, partnered or will have direct consultation with Aboriginal leadership or stakeholders, which is great to see and it complements the work that you'll be having under the um, Aboriginal Family Safety Strategy. Uh, I think the next steps for that will be the actually officially the signing of the agreements. And as I said previously, we'll be working with the centre under their Preventing Violence Together to roll out communities of practice specifically for those grant recipients. And Communities does intend to do an independent evaluation of these projects to determine how they are working to achieve the outcomes that they, we're hoping that they can achieve. Thanks, That's great. Um, so our next speaker is Fiona, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the work of Family and Domestic Violence Response Team at Central. Thanks very much, Nicole. Uh, Kaya, my name's Fiona. Um, I've just started in the FDBRT Central uh, team um, and very excited to let you know that we are fully staffed as a new team as of next Monday. So you can see uh, to the left of your screen, there's quite a few um, people in the team, uh, including some of our partner agencies, WA Police and Department of Justice, which I think is um, a wonderful way to work when we can uh, work together in with three different mindsets, all um, managing the same issues. So it's um, it's a very strong team already, and we're looking forward to welcoming the whole team together uh, on Monday. Um, as part of uh, 16 days on Tuesday, last Tuesday, very excited to announce, uh, well, to advise you that the government announced um, 11 million dollars towards family safety officers being embedded over the next three years throughout the state in each of our 17 family and domestic violence response teams. So the $11 million uh, is also going to go towards an evaluation of the enhanced FDVRT uh, model, uh, which is due back in, I think, 2026 to government. Uh, but the, the 34 family safety officers actually um, is represents two additional officers in every family domestic violence response team. And these, these officers will be um, employees of Department of Communities. 
but their role is quite different to uh, the existing role of the FDBRT. So they, the roles and responsibilities haven't yet been established and they will be established in consultation with the community with uh, Aboriginal organisations. Uh, and how they're rolled out will be in consultation with um, community and with our stakeholders. Uh, but it's critical that uh, their priority will be on focusing on providing a culturally responsive service for Aboriginal people and families which will be facilitated in part by uh, seeking to employ Aboriginal people in these roles. Uh, the focus will be on Aboriginal families as it recognises the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people, particularly women and children, as victim survivors of serious family violence assault, and it recognises the critical importance of promoting family safety in reducing overrepresentation of Aboriginal children in the child protection system. Uh, so in that way, they'll be uh, slightly different. But as I said, um, it's an exciting time because uh, establishing how they work uh, over the next three years uh, will be in consultation with you. And um, yeah, really look forward to seeing what we can do in this space. We have a, a Department of Justice pilot. So apart from the two Department of Justice officers that we have embedded in the FDVRT central team with us. We've rolled out a pilot in two locations, one regional, one metro in Fremantle and Broome, and that's embedding uh, adult community corrections officers within the FDVRT teams uh, to see what they could bring to enhance our responses to reports of family and domestic violence. There's been an evaluation of that report and um, it sort of leads on to my next point, which is the governance that's been established for the FDVRT. We've now got, and many of you um, online in this webinar will be part of this governance, which is the um, Executive Steering Committee and the Operational Working Group for FDVRT. And so the Department of Justice pilot, we've um, created a report and we've spoken to both the Executive Steering Committee and the Operational Working Group about the effectiveness of uh, justice being in the FDVRTs, which I would be sure that you would all agree uh, simply makes sense. Um, they've been partnering for a long time, but being embedded, um, the early outcomes have indicated that it's been successful. So um, although they're not funded at this point in time, where we'll look at um, where we can take that into the future. So that's another exciting space that we're looking at. The next steps for us are, are building the team and establishing the authorising environment. Um, we'll be um, progressing against agreed activities um, from our independent FDVRT review, uh, managing governance and um, embedding consistency across all FDVRTs in service delivery. And we'll be constantly seeking opportunities for improvement. And uh, that includes encouraging local service delivery and support of place-based solutions throughout the state. Uh, these will all be aligned to uh, government priorities. So um, yeah, it's a really exciting time to be part of this team. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so our next speaker is Emma Roscoe, and Emma is one part of our two people who are working on commissioning, or should I say 1.6 people that are working on commissioning for us. Um, the commissioning, as I kind of said at the outset, at least in my view, really sits as part of the foundation for all of our work. It's such a key and primary way that we can try and support implementation of our strategic policy, embed in innovation, uh, think about the ways that we can support and create integration, including with the department and our practice work and with our FDVRT. So I really see the commissioning as so essential and fundamental to everything that we do, and we're really invested in um, doing it really well. So Emma, if I can hand over to you, yeah. please. Um, so probably most of you are aware, um, work is in the final stages of phase one, which was the family and domestic uh, of the sorry the family and domestic violence commissioning project, um, and that was the development of the scalable and sustainable cost model um, for family and domestic violence uh, refuges and safe houses. Uh, this phase has included significant sector engagement um, from webinars, workshops um, and advice from um, our expert reference group, which includes um, people from 
Curtin University, Aboriginal organisations, and um, both peaks. Um, and there was also a sector uh, census sent out as well as part of the sector uh, engagement. So now we're starting to look at phase two, um, which is the actual development of the Family and Domestic Violence uh, Strategic Commissioning Plan. Um, and that's currently being scoped. Uh, recently, there were two workshops um, in relation to the safe home providers, um, just to discuss their current service model um, and the expansion of the safe at home program, which was some additional FTE. Uh, the office is now working towards um, how we approach the um, strategic commissioning plan and continue to work alongside the sector um, and obviously people with lived experience and uh, work with the expert reference group. Thanks Emma um, and I might just take this opportunity to add I guess in that space that um, the other element of our commissioning work in the family violence space is around a strategic asset plan so having really clear visibility of uh, both the condition and suitability of the current houses, if you like, or uh, premises that we're using particularly to operate refuge and safe house services out of. And part of that asset plan, I guess at least our hope is, is that it then starts to feed in our thinking around a more deliberate and systematic approach to how we fund refurbishment in this place and how we look at and fund replacement. So that's sort of the other piece of work that's ticking away in the background. And at the moment, we're really just collating the inputs on that and then we'll be in a better position to start talking to people about it. Um, many of you or some of you may also be aware that we're also leading the commissioning work for child sexual abuse therapeutic services. Much like the family violence safe house and refuge space, this is a service group that operates on, um, for what they do, very small amounts of money. So we've really been undertaking a program of work that helps um, set out what it is that we need in this space and critically, what did the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse tell us that we need in terms of providing specialised responses to children who've experienced sexual abuse and adult survivors of sexual abuse. So we're in a similar space there where we're pulling together all that relevant information and evidence around what does this sector need to look like, what are the critical components of a service model and and therefore, you, you know, what is our expectation around costs? So I guess these pieces of work are at similar points, but also somewhat different because our family violence work so far is really only focused on one slice of the service sector. Um, so I guess the other thing I wanted to say is because we have been really focused on pulling all of that information together, we haven't been as um, we haven't been communicating as much as we should be probably in those spaces. So um, I really just want to apologise. There's probably been a bit of a gap in our last communication to everyone around this work, um, but we will certainly undertake to get some information out to everyone um, by early next week to give a you know a bit more of a stepped pro a stepped outline around where we're at with both of those pieces of work. Um, I guess with that said, I'm going to pass over to Mike Basto, who's from our practice team and is also one of two people currently in this <laughs> team, although we, um, our manager's position is currently vacant and we'll be looking at filling that in the early part of next year because our former manager, Renee Joffrey, has taken up the position of Regional Executive Director in the Kimberley, which is wonderful for Renee. Um, just not so wonderful for us. <laughs> uh, Mike, if I can hand over to you. Thanks, Nicole, and good morning, everyone. I must admit I was a little bit jealous sitting next to Fiona when she was happily announcing to you all that the team will be fully staffed as of Monday. Uh, but that certainly doesn't curb sort of the enthusiasm and the, the direction that the practice team is sort of working towards. Um, and moving into next year, certainly looking forward to having the full team back on board um, and carrying on uh, what we've commenced, uh, I guess, in the second half of this year. Um, so the practice team is uh, another one of the newly established teams within the office structure um, and maybe one that you guys um, may be not as familiar with because uh, the focus is, I guess, a little bit more internally on communities um, and us as a department and how we are functioning and operating in the prevention of family and domestic violence space. Um, since the machineries of government changes and bringing together all of the functions that now make up us as the Department of Communities, um, there have been a lot of efforts to, to push towards uh, practicing better and delivering better services um, that we deliver within this space, um, but hasn't necessarily been a clear oversight or um, 
I guess, coordination of what that looks like. Um, a lot of the work has lived uh, very much in the legacy functions of the Department of Communities. Um, so one of the, the key, I guess, priorities for us as the practice team has been to look at establishing um, a consistent FDV informed policy position and definition for communities. So that as an agency, we all have that clear understanding um, and foundation around family and domestic violence. Um, and then we can build on that around how we need to go about in our own service provision and delivery, um, how we can best respond to that in, um, I guess, very much on a with a focus on being family and domestic violence informed. Um, so what, I guess the work that we've been doing up until this point is then very much about um, mapping uh, a lot of the touch points of the Department of Communities and Family and Domestic Violence. And the more we've worked through that process, um, I think the more we've uncovered the, the size of the challenge that we have in front of us, um, not just looking at uh, clients and families that we engage with, um, but also looking at our, our internal functions, our internal governance, um, how we work with our more than 6,000 employees that we have across the state. So looking at all aspects of communities and the touch points of family and domestic violence. Um, the next part of that, though, is definitely building towards delivering um, a family and domestic violence informed practice model across communities. So really honing in on our frontline service delivery, our statutory roles and um, all of those functions that we have. Um, and with that, the way we're looking to build and, and develop what that looks like is uh, being very strongly informed by the principles and critical components of the Safe and Together model. Um, Communities is a partner agency with uh, the Safe and Together Institute, um, and we've been doing some work with David Mandel around uh, what that can look like for us as an agency moving forward, um, including an organisational assessment to give us that real picture of kind of where things are at at the moment um, and some recommendations and uh, plans that we can start to implement moving forward. Um, and then the final, I guess, key priority in terms of what we're, we're looking to develop in um, and start to roll out to what, as we move into 2023 um, is what our workforce capability framework looks like in that space. So um, it's all good and well to say, um, sit here and develop a model and talk about uh, that's what we want to implement. Uh, but it's then looking at our people and our workforce and how we can go about um, providing people with the skills, the knowledge and the support that they need to do the work that they're doing uh, with a skill base that will allow them to do it in the, the most effective and efficient way that we can. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Um, so I'm going to take the floor a little bit now and talk to you a little bit about what our priorities are for 2023. And really, I guess my colleagues have touched on many of these, but these, I guess, just probably represent some of the things that will be top of mind for us and top of our priority list um, early in the new year. Um, they are absolutely the design work that we need and want to do around the family safety offices. And critically to that is that thinking around supporting uh, culturally responsive service delivery and understanding that what the implications are of that, given that these will be community staff. So there's you know, a bit that we need to work through in that space. Um, but added to that, I mean, these positions are being added to the Family and Domestic Violence Response Team for the purpose or partly for the purpose of supporting multi-agency case management of our high risk, high harm cases. And what that in effect means is that engagement work to a much wider audience of organisations and services than what the FDVRT might necessarily be engaged with on a regular basis now. So really regrouping and rethinking around um, how we're supporting the protocol arrangements around that, how we're supporting practices around really good and rigorous information exchange. And really, I guess then coming into that is how we're doing that refresh work around the common risk assessment and risk management framework as a key sort of foundational and fundamental tool or practice guide that can support our interagency work in this space. We will continue to prioritise our commissioning work. Um, I've mentioned the coordinated response services there um, as a service group that we're particularly aware um, is currently operating with a higher level of funding than what is the recurrent amount. So we're looking to secure that higher level of funding to enable us then to enter into longer term agreements at that higher level to prevent us from going through this kind of continual rollover process with those agreements. So that's something that we're working to at the moment and we will address more particularly with that sector. There are other 
service groups in the whole family violence space that are in similar positions. And I guess we'll be starting a process, a bit of tailored communication to each of those service groups to give them um, some context and understanding of if they have a contract expiring in the next 12 to 18 months, what can they reasonably expect might be sort of that next step, um, given that we're undertaking, undertaking this kind of broader commissioning work. Um, we will be focused on acquitting the first action plan of path to safety, as Selena said, and really, I guess, um, final, well, preparing and finalising the second action plan. And then the fourth piece, which I don't know that we've necessarily spoken about directly in this webinar today, but is something that you would have heard from Stopping Family Violence and something you might have heard from us before, but we're really looking to finalise and release the perpetrator response framework, which is a wonderful piece of work that Stopping Family Violence well, was contracted to produce and is um, very close to being ready for release. So that's something that we'll be prioritising early in 23. Um, so we, just the last slide, I guess, um, is we're also committed to continuing to offer these webinars, um, but we're probably open to hearing from you, whether it's, you know, in the chat, you know, in, in forums where you're dealing with us, you know, more directly, in meetings, whatever it is, to hear about what it is that might be useful. We're happy to carry on with the format that we've been using, which is much more about sort of updating the work and signposting opportunities for engagement. Um, I guess some of my early thoughts is, um, there's possibly opportunity to do to do that, to keep going with the updates so that you've got that visibility to the work, but also maybe to bring in some other elements. And one thing that I'm quite aware of is that over the last probably three years, there's been an awful lot of grant funding go out to the sector, um, a lot of it time limited, that's provided opportunity really to try things that you know, maybe haven't been done in the sector before. So I guess I'm really conscious that a lot of that work has kind of happened and it's been great work and it's sort of now, I don't want to lose sight of it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I feel like there might be an opportunity to hear from some of the organisations around what they've done with some of that grant funding. Certainly the government has invested quite a lot in evaluation over the last few years and particularly the new some of the uh, election commitments have been evaluated, so potentially if there's an interest, we would be keen to use these webinars as an opportunity to um, share some of the findings that we've received from those evaluations and, and use that as a bit of a starting point for thinking about how we take that learning and build it into our commissioning work or build it into our policy development, depending on you know what that evaluation looks like. Um, and also, I mean, just generally, you know, probably the sky's the limit, really. So if you've got another type of suggestion, then we'll really be open to hearing it. It's something that we can think about how we build into our webinars in 23. Um, with all of that said, really, I guess we'll probably um, start the Q&A component of the webinar. Um, I can see that we've got some questions in the chat already, which is great. Thank you very much for that. If you have a question or there's something that you've been thinking about, please post it. Or if there's a question in there that you particularly want answered, please like it and we'll just you know, make sure that we get to that sooner rather than later. Um, we have been getting through all the questions, so I don't think there's, there'll be a worry that we won't, but if by any chance we don't get through all the questions, then we'll publish a written answer to it. Um, so I'm just gonna run through from the top, I think. Um, yeah, I can just read it out. This is the first one. Um, so we have a question which is new contracts for refugees, Columba Road. When will we know about funding agreement as the contract ends on the 1st of July 23? Um, thank you for the question. Um, we will, there's an interesting thing about um, that particular agreement is that it's part of our, as far as how we categorise the funding, it's part of our service group around counselling and advocacy services. So my understanding at the moment is that anyone who's providing a counselling advocacy service into the community, including, I think that group includes two or three safe house services, you would have a contract that's expiring on 1st of July 23, as this person has mentioned. Um, we will be contacting everybody very soon to let you know what the next steps are around those agreements. Um, and yes, and that will come through our contracting area. So um, I guess 
I will follow up and make sure that that information comes out to you very shortly because we've certainly uh, reached a position on what we think is the next step on that. Um, so the next question is around the family and domestic violence response teams and the pilot with the Department of Justice. So Fiona, just so you're prepared, I'm going to hand this question okay. to you. Um, what learnings and areas for improvement with DOJ integration have emerged from the two locations where the DOJ, DOJ has been involved in the FDBRT? Okay, thanks Nicole. Um, so some of the learnings um, were that uh, sharing information in a coordinated fashion um, at the time is, um, is more effective then provisioning information to DOJ uh, where there's often a lag because, uh, so let me go back one step. In the current uh, model, Department of Justice sometimes seeks additional information um, from the FDBRTs and that can uh, be, there can be a little bit of a lag and sometimes um, the FDBRTs are unable to provision as much information as might assist um, the whole case uh, because of their current workload. So having the Department of Justice embedded in the FDVRTs, they learned that um, bringing justice to the table and their information holdings was a lot more effective because there was an information exchange rather than an information provision at a later time. So it made the entire model around family safety a, a lot more effective. Uh, so that's probably the main um, outcome, that, the main positive outcome. Uh, the learnings we'll, we'll get to as we um, as we progress. It was a very short um, pilot, it was only three months. Um, so um, I think what's really required is that the Department of Justice are already, like all of us, uh, um, uh, have plenty of business to do and so there'll be need to seek additional funding in order to be able to provision that additional service um, and that in their current FTE they're unable to to continue is is the indication. So the learning is that um, perhaps we need to together uh, find a model where it, it is possible statewide. Thanks Fiona um, and I guess just the other other point probably on that evaluation report is that it's currently with our executive steering group for consideration and I think it's probably our expectation that once it has sort of approval through that group and once it's been briefed appropriately through the respective agencies um, that we would be happy to make it available um, so that people can see and read uh, the information for themselves um, and just picking up on what Fiona was saying absolutely we need to work through how we might be able to manage an expansion process, um, though at this stage the two silence sites that have the justice addition to the FDVRT, they will continue as they have been in the pilot locations. Um, so the next question is also one related to commissioning, which is a little bit similar to the one earlier, and it is many of the current FTV services have had service agreements extended to 2027. Will this also be the case for the remaining FTB services with service agreements expiring in 23 or 24? Um, so I guess what I would say is that it is absolutely our um, priority and interest in um, securing longer term agreements for everyone who's providing family and domestic violence services in this space. I guess what anybody who's got an agreement expiring in 2023 I think probably reasonably, and I might be speaking out of turn, but I think you can probably expect that the next step will be a short term extension, which then gives us the opportunity to do that work around assessment for a longer term agreement. So that information will come to you as it relates to each of those specific service groups, because they are all slightly different, um, but we'll make sure that that information comes out to you um, as soon as possible and preferably uh, within the next week or two. Um, any other? Uh, so we, the next question is, will the expert reference group continue to operate and provide consultation advice to other aspects of FTB commissioning? Um, yes, it certainly will. The original terms of reference for the expert reference group um, included both phases of the commissioning work. 
I think probably what we might do at this point, given that we're halfway through the program of work and it has been a significant kind of investment of time for our expert reference group members, is we'll check with them that they're happy to continue on that group. We'll just reassess the membership. We'll do, I guess, just a bit of a checking and a touch point. But it is absolutely our intention that we continue to operate in that way, where we have a really, I guess, robust oversight from a group that's representative of the sector. So yes, it's our intention that that will continue. Um, so what method of commissioning will be applied to the recontracting of CRS services in 23? PSP, retendering, or is this to be confirmed? At this point, it's to be confirmed because we um, are in the process of trying to secure the current funding level. So really, once, we've, once we have an outcome on that, then we'll be able to um, assess what the appropriate procurement method is. So it is TBC on that one at the moment. Um, will there be opportunities for new providers in the CSATS program? Um, also a really good question that unfortunately is contingent and dependent on funding. So once we have a, an outcome on funding for child sexual abuse therapeutic services, then again, you know, we will be in a position to assess what our options are around that service group. So, um, Yep, so unfortunately, both of those in relation to the CRS and the CSATS program are to be confirmed depending on um, funding. Uh, is there an opportunity for complementary funding for those organisations currently funded by the Commonwealth to provide family violence services? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I. I the, what I hope the answer is, is yes, but practically I'm not sure how that might happen yet. Um, so I guess one thing that we are yet to have visibility of as a state is how the Commonwealth budget commitments will be um, will be disseminated into the states and territories. So many of you will have seen that the Commonwealth budget announcements included a number of line items related to family violence service delivery. Some of those included commitments like um, introducing 500 new family violence workers around Australia, extending keeping women safe in their home program, um, uh, investment in perpetrator intervention, um, and many, many other things. I, I couldn't tell you all of them off the top of my head. What we yet to understand is, is that money going to come to us as a state government to administer or is it going to be directly procured through the Commonwealth? And I think, you know, much like most of our family violence services in this space, they are either all or mostly in some way funded through or in part of a Commonwealth agreement. So we're really just trying to understand how those budgetary measures are going to be applied or administered, which will then give us a bit better understanding about what some of our options and opportunities might be, which is why that family violence commissioning is so essential. And I guess really being able to have an understanding as an entire service and sector group as to what it is that we're trying to achieve, what's the service array that we think is ideal, what are those priorities for future and further investment that then help us step out how we um, administer funding. So I think that we can expect that there will continue to be investment in family violence, whether that be through state or federal. So I think there will be opportunity into the future. We just don't have that sort of direct information yet at this stage about how those immediate Commonwealth announcements are going to impact on us as a state. Great, that's all of our questions. Um, I'll just sort of um, perhaps provide my colleagues an opportunity for final comment if anyone's got one while people might be typing in any final questions. So perhaps if we start with Gail, was there anything else you wanted to add, Gail? No, I don't have any. I think there are a couple of things that we yet to implement that I just forgot on the bottom of my slide, That's right. which uh, is the rapid rehousing, uh, the counselling, youth, youth counselling, yep. and one other. So, uh, the Armadale Hub. Armadale Hub. So yep. yeah, they're yet to be announced. Yep. So those processes, which were all open tender processes, are still being finalised, which means that we haven't been able to make an announcement today, but they are all close to announcement. So you'll be able to expect that information soon. 
Uh, Don't feel pressure. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Um, the thing that I'd like to acknowledge is that this year we also, and it probably has been acknowledged in other fora, but we um, established the Office for Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence, which is a pretty amazing milestone in terms of a, a, a policy achievement. But also we got our first executive director, so I just wanted to acknowledge your leadership and the stability that that's brought to the portfolio as well as that first slide about the breadth of the, the work that we're doing. Um, it's it's such a great, um, it's great to be at this point. So thanks for that, Nicole. Thanks, Lena, that's very nice. Um, and I guess, you know, you know, many of you know, I've been in the family violence area for a long time and for a long time, it's been our aspiration to have such a wide reach. And, you know, I think we're all pretty excited about the opportunity to be able to have that sort of um, kind of multilateral focus on so many aspects of the ways that family violence impacts on our business as an agency and the way that it impacts on people in our community. So it's very exciting times. Emma? Um, whilst I haven't been doing the commissioning for very long, I just want to acknowledge the sector and all the work that they've done so far to get mm -hmm. the first phase done um, and all the sector engagement and all their amazing expertise and um, really looking forward to continuing that working relationship next year for phase two. Thanks, Emma. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Um, and similarly uh, to Emma, mm -hmm. I'd like to acknowledge all the hard work that the FDVRTs do statewide. Um, I know the links that you go to previously worked in the sector in another role. Um, and so I'm looking forward to getting out to meet all of you very soon and hear from you directly and the, the issues that are presented to you and the great um, ways that you're dealing with those issues. Um, that's a particularly exciting part of this role. Uh, but I would like to acknowledge all the hard work um, from everyone. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, Fiona. And Mike? I think just similarly to Selena's comments about, um, I guess the, the exciting opportunity that the office gives within communities around that, um, I guess, authorising environment and space to be able to implement and as has been discussed, there's a huge reach in terms of what the office covers now, um, but being able to have that, I guess, this kind of central point around coordinating and making sure that everything's kind of pulling in the same direction is a, a really exciting opportunity. Um, and I think 2023 is going to be a very exciting year. Thanks, Mike. Um, it doesn't seem like we've had any other questions in the chat. Um, so with all of that said, uh, we'll sign off. Uh, we won't be We'll, the next webinar will come to you in the new year. So if we don't see you between now and then, then please have a wonderful Christmas. Um, and otherwise, um, yeah, that's it from us. Thanks, everyone.